Evelyn, I have started the recording. You should have a pop up appearing. OK, thank you. Um, good evening, everybody, and welcome to this meeting of the Community Liaison Committee, Tuesday, the 27th of April at six o'clock. Um, I'm Councillor Sally Hanks, and I will be chairing this meeting this evening. Just a few housekeeping um, rules that will help us all. May I remind everyone present this evening that this will be recorded via the internet and, re and the um, recording archived for future viewing. Could all participants please mute themselves when not speaking in order to avoid any background noise or feedback? If a participant wants to speak, could they please raise their hand or, and use the raise hand function on your computer? It's also helpful to lower your hand after you've asked the question as well, please. Um, please ensure that all the debate is raised verbally and not via the chat function for the sake of the recording. The chat function may be used to highlight any technical issues and to grab the attention of the chairman or one of the democratic officers. If any participant is having difficulty hearing when addressing the committee, then they should let the chairman or democratic officer know. If they have their webcam on and have interruption, turning this off sometimes helps. So welcome to all town and community council reps and we'll start the meeting. And the first agenda item number one is apologies for absence. Amy, have you got any apologies, please? I, I do, thank you, Chairman. Um, apologies have been received in advance from um, uh, Mr Andrew from Cowbridge Town Council, um, Mr Thomas from Pendoylan Community Council and Mr Oliver from Wenvo Community Council. Thank you. Do I have any other apologies from anybody? No. I believe Councillor Carroll is suggesting, Chair. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Janice Charles from the Vale of Glamorgan Council. Thank you, um, Councillor. Agenda item three, no, agenda item two minutes of the meeting held on the 26th of January. Are we all in agreement that these are a correct record? Um, if I see no hands or anything, I take it that we are all in agreement. Yeah, we're happy to accept these minutes as a true record. Item number three, do I have any declarations of interest under the Council's Code of Conduct, please? No, I can't see any hands or anything. Thank you very much. Um, agenda item four. Have we got Chief Inspector Arabella Rees in the meeting? She has connected, Chair. Yeah. Hello, Arabella. I'd like to formally hello, yeah. hello. I'd like to formally welcome you to the um, to your first community liaison meeting this evening, um, and thank you for coming. It's Chief Inspector Arabella Rees. So, can I pass over to you for your report, please? Absolutely. Thank you so much, and um, thank you for the opportunity to come this evening. I'm really grateful for that. Um, I intend to approach just as, as a short introduction um, in relation to myself, a slight overview of crime for the Vale of Glamorgan recently, um, a coronavirus input, and then an overview of our plans for the next period, uh, for the summer plan specifically and focuses. So um, as I've been introduced, I'm Chief Inspector Arabella Reese. I took over from Tony Williams earlier this month and I have responsibility for the delivery of operational policing across Cardiff South and then the Vale of Glamorgan. I've been with South Wales Police for 10 years, having started out as a PCSO and joining as an officer in 2012. I was promoted as Chief Inspector in 2019. I've been working with the Chief Constable directly for the last couple of years. And as I said, I landed here at the beginning of April. Um, I've been really pleased since I've landed to see just how well my team here are working um, with the Vale of Glamorgan Council, our partners and councillors in our communities. And I'm really grateful for the good relationship that is clearly in place. And that's manifest itself as well in the invite for me to attend this evening. 
In relation to a broad crime update for the Vale of Glamorgan, I've looked at the reporting period from the 25th of January of this year up until the 25th of April, because I understand that the 25th of January was your last meeting date, so the last update that would have been given by my predecessor. During that period, uh, we've had approximately 1,700 crimes reported as having occurred within the Vale of Glamorgan area, the majority of which took place in Barry and the surrounding areas there. This represents an approximate 4.5% reduction when you were to compare it with the same period last year, which I, is a generally fair comparison because it was before most of the civil restrictions were put into place last year. There's been a number of reductions in different crime areas. Um, for example, com commercial burglaries have um, really reduced over this period, as have residential uh, burglaries in the area. There's also been quite a significant reduction in the number of violence incidents that have resulted in injury. In relation to uh, coronavirus and the impact that that's having on our communities, again, I've gone for the same reporting period, so that being 25th of January of this year to 25th of April. During that period, um, South Wales Police recorded 930 COVID-related occurrences as having occurred in the Vale of Glamorgan area. The majority of those uh, will have been recorded as being breaches of um, civil restrictions. Again, the majority have happened in the Barry area and then broadly uh, across Penarth and then the rural Vale. As you know, um, or Sorry, as I assume you may know from previous um, conversations, South Wales Police has uh, very much followed the what's been known nationally as the 4E model. So engaging with members of the public, explaining the need to follow civil re restrictions, encouraging them to do so, enforcing as a last resort. Unfortunately, during this reporting period, we have had to take enforcement against a number of people for breaches of restrictions. So and we've issued um, over 270 uh, fixed penalty notices. Primarily, they've been in relation to persons gathering in indoors and then the movement of persons. The greatest number, again, being in the Barry area. Uh, as we um, move into the next period, it won't have been lost on everybody that outdoor hospitality has uh, now reopened. We weren't too sure how that would look and feel in our communities. However, for the Vale of Glamorgan, whilst it, um, it has been busy, over the last 24 hours, uh, we haven't seen any significant concerns and we're really pleased about that. We were working with um, colleagues at the local authority throughout and will continue to do so. And our joint enforcement teams will continue to face down some of the complexities of businesses reopen, uh, reopening during this period. I'll come on now to the summer plans. I've been in post for three weeks. I've had lots of questions around what we're going to do in the summer um, and how we're going to manage perhaps some of the uncertainties that sit around international travel and uncertainties because of the pandemic and the increase of visitors that could potentially occur then coming to our coastline. So from the 1st of May running to the 5th of September, we're going to be running a coastal operation that will be focusing on um, areas that we know attract a large number of uh, local people, visitors, and also holiday makers. And we've identified eight resort locations. Those are the ones that we know attract large numbers and therefore increase demand, but also those that we know that there are community concerns that are raised quite often um, and ones where we preempt that we may see some large numbers. They stretch from um, Cardiff Bay, which is also within my patch, appreciate it's not for yourselves here tonight, all the way through to Ogmore by Sea. Allowing us to deal with them as one under one operation ensures that we have a consistency of a policing message, proper coordination of resources and confidence. If we deal with a problem in one area, we're not simply going to bounce it down the coastline to another area. I want if we deal with an issue, I just don't want to see it repeated anywhere, um, anywhere else. We're working really um, closely with colleagues in the local authority to overlay the policing operation um, with their plans. And we're also in discussion with other key partners and other blue light services in order to do the same. No doubt that um, those who have joined this evening may have seen that we put Section 35 notice and dispersal powers in for the first time at Ogmore by Sea over the course of the weekend. Um, I, I know we have questions after this, if anyone wants me to explain more about what Section 35 powers are, then I'm absolutely willing to do that. 
but we saw some good results from doing so. Uh, there's a press release gone out this evening. I've um, I've shared uh, the link across with the administrator of this meeting, but we used 35 powers effectively at Ogman by Sea with four individuals who had travelled to the location from Pontypool. They had drunk alcohol. They'd gotten some difficulties in the sea, had to be helped out of the sea by the RLNI, uh, continued to drink alcohol and... Um, summary position is they were making use of themselves so we took their alcohol we put them in some taxis and we sent them away having banned them from returning um, returning to the area for the 48 hour period time so our plan said over the summer is going to be continuing step through that process taking enforcement action when we need to and making sure that we're in a position where we can respond to the uh, needs and concerns of our communities in a reactive basis but actually putting ourselves on the front foot by being where we need to be to try and stop those issues from occurring in the first place. A couple of other focuses that you may have seen um, in the media that this week is Op Scepter Week. Op Scepter is a national operation, it's designed to raise awareness um, of and tackle knife crime across England and Wales. Knife crime in the Vale of Morgan is reducing, so I'm, I'm pleased to be able to tell you that. Um, however, on the same link that I've shared with the administrator of this meeting, you will see that we did make an arrest on the weekend at Penarth Esplanade for, for a 19-year-old male from the Cardiff area who travelled and was in possession of a bladed article. So over the course of this week, our teams are going to be out and about. They're going to be doing activities such as inputs at our schools, raising awareness of the impact of knife crime in our communities. There's going to be engagement events running at key locations, and we'll also have surrender bins outside the police station in order that persons can put the knives there should they so wish. Uh, we also continuing to focus on rogue traders operating in the area and just last week we undertook an operation uh, with the Vale of Morgan Shed Regulatory Services and our Community Safety Partnership to um, tackle rogue traders operating in our area. It was a successful operation, there was a number of uh, positive action elements taken and we've got more planned for the next period. So um, that's my update. I'm aware that I think it now opens up for questions. So I would just ask that we remember I've only been here for the three weeks and I really would like to hear this as an opportunity to hear about the concerns that are being raised um, to yourselves in order that I can use that to scope out my policing plans. Lovely. Thank you very much for that report, Chief Inspector. I see we've got a few raised hands and um, the first one is Councillor Mark Wilson. OK. Thank you very much for your, your brief presentation, Arabella, and welcome um, to the Belgium Organ in your new world. Um, just a few things. I am a local councillor in Penarth, represent the Stanwell Ward in Penarth, which also includes um, quite a few areas near, very near adjacent to the town centre, but obviously St Augustine's is a town centre ward in Penarth, just a bit of background. Um, a couple of issues. First issue, mostly dominate the town centre, but not exclusively, is the growth in graffiti at the moment, notably tags. And um, I just wondered perhaps what sort of action the South Wales Police are doing about that. And secondly, obviously, we've got the open up of hospitality now. And obviously, you know, there are concerns out there in the community about noise, about possible drunkenness especially over the weekend. I just wonder what sort of plans South Wales Police are going to be dealing with that. Thank you. OK, so if I come to the second point first, so the opening up of the hospitality and the concerns around noise um, and disturbances, we're really alive to these concerns in our communities. We've been without the nighttime economy um, in its purest sense for over 12 months now. And um, we know that we're not too sure how it's going to look and feel in our communities when it opens back up, whether we're going to see um, everybody flocking to the city centre of Cardiff or whether we may actually see greater activity in the suburbs, such as um, Penarth and across some of our other um, licensed premises. So as um, we've been leading up to the reopening, we've been working really hard with our community safety partnership and our colleagues in licensing within the local authority to actually be speaking with those licensed premises so that they understand their obligations, they reminding them of their license obligations. In terms of a proactive sense, and you specifically mentioned this weekend, um, because it's the bank holiday weekend and it's the first that we've really had since the outdoor hospitality, um, I'd like to reassure you that we have got some sufficient policing plans in place to deal with any 
Um, I don't want to say fallout, but any added demand um, or any impact in our communities as a consequence of those um, establishments reopening. So we, we've got it and we're proactively prepared for that. Hopefully we won't need it. Grateful to um, hear concerns from our communities, though, if they do feel that that impacts upon them. The second point um, you've mentioned is around graffiti. We discussed this earlier this week in um, our meeting with the local authority because specifically in Penarth there has been an increase. And it's, um, from my understanding, what's being fed back to me and anecdotally is even when it's cleared away or repainted over, it's reappearing quite quickly. There's plans in place to um, try and enforce our CCTV provisions. So uh, from a policing perspective, we have opportunities around mobile CCTV available to us. And I'm in the process of getting our teams trained up in that. So if there are key locations where we're seeing it or we're seeing those repeat incidents, they would be really grateful to be made aware of that because we can put the CCTV in as a deterrent, um, either where we're seeing repeat incidents or if there's sort of like places, so if it's particular places that um, we need to put some observations in. Chair, can I respond, if possible, just quickly? Yes, Councillor. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for your response. Um, just just a couple, just one observation, really. It'd be quite useful if you could have your um, email address so that we can contact you about locations of graffiti, OK, in Penarth and other areas. Thank you. Yep, that wouldn't um, that wouldn't be a problem. Do you uh, do you have or have across this group have the email addresses of my local policing inspectors? Are they available to the councillors who are on this call? Not I, as far as I know. They're not I, at the moment, Chief Inspector. No. Um, previously, the committee have had um, had Chief Inspector Williams um, direct information. Um, but if you want to share what you think is most appropriate with me, I can make sure that that's passed on to all members. Fantastic, I'll do that because I have a local, local policing inspector for Barry and Rural Vale and I also have one for Penarth and Cardiff Bay. So you've got the three of us. So um, I will put a note together after this meeting, share them across and they can be put out to the councillors. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I ask Councillor Robertson to ask his question next, please? Uh, thank you for that report, uh, Chief Inspector Rees. Uh, I, I have an issue in Dennis Paris uh, uh, Ward. Uh, I have a resident uh, who lives in Kyrent Gardens. Uh, he's a, a, a very socially minded resident and uh, he, he, he's actually reported a number of uh, incidents of, uh, um, uh, let's say, bad behaviour, uh, some criminal behaviour. He's reported it to the police. Uh, and I'm not happy with the response he's had from the police, actually. Uh, he has made himself a bit of a target by actually uh, stepping forward and trying to uh, highlight some issues in the area. Uh, Carwent Gardens actually uh, is a, a new development uh, which is adjacent to Kylie and Road. And there have been issues. Uh, but what I'm really concerned about is that uh, he has been told that he should only report issues which apply specifically to him. He's he's actually suffered quite a lot of intimidation uh, from people who feel that uh, uh, he's making waves in the area. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to mention any names. Uh, I don't think that would be helpful. Uh, but... Uh, what I really do want to see is actually the police to take him seriously and to actually act on uh, some of the information that he is giving them, uh, which I have to say I haven't seen uh, so far. OK, um, I would, without going into names, I believe I know the uh, matter that we are talking about. Um, what I would say just broadly is that there's only been three reports to police of matters of concern during the last reporting period. Um, that's not to say that there aren't concerns, but I don't know if they're being reported directly to the police or whether they're being reported into other forums. And um, I know that that advice has been given. I would um, 
welcome councillor once we've circulated the email addresses if you wanted to document the specific concerns that you have conscious of the forum that we're on at the moment and send them over then i can have a look at each one of those and respond to them appropriately uh, i actually sent an email to uh, the police officer who's dealing with this and i didn't re receive any response uh, I, I went to a, a meeting that uh, this resident was having with a police officer, uh, uh, which was uh, scheduled uh, for six o'clock. Uh, the police officer didn't arrive until uh, 7.30, and I think that was as a result of me leaving, uh, I wouldn't say a shirty, but it was a, a rather stiff uh, uh, message on her um, uh, answer phone. Uh, I, OK, I think Councillor, I, 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 we've I, sorted on, that and I think then are you happy for the Chief Inspector to have her email distributed and then make contact? I think that's the way forward. OK. Yeah, thank you very happy much. Thank yeah, you. thank you, Councillor. Can I ask Councillor Michael Morgan, please, for his question? Here I am. Uh, well, I say welcome, Chief Inspector, to the fold. It's nice to see you this evening. Very quick question, really. I'm the uh, Vail Councillor for the Peterston Super Really Ward, which covers the uh, communities of Pendoyland, Peterston, Well St Donuts, St Brides and St George's. And time was that we would have um, an officer at regular community council meetings to give a report. But gradually that fizzled out. And during the lockdown period, um, again, we've had regular Zoom meetings, but we never get an in-person report from an officer. There's always a, you know, a written report giving some detail, but it, it used to give confidence to the community to see an officer present. And I'm just wondering whether that community involvement could be reinstated and whether we could see an officer at the regular community council meetings. Thank you. Okay. And Councillor, are those meetings being held online, such as this meeting, or are they being held in person at the moment? Uh, they, we're all on Zoom at the moment, so there are no in-person meetings. But, um, you know, would, it would be good if, if an officer could spare 10 minutes or so to, to just to drop in online. Uh, you know, we, we, I'll give you an example. The other day we had, a, we had a, an incident in the village which required immediate police attention in the middle of the night. And officers turned out and they were present within six minutes. So we're not concerned about the service you get from our, our officers. But it's nice to be able to see them and relate to them. Because you know, we, we don't see you going around on bicycles anymore, and I don't expect that. But it would be nice just to, to see faces and people to engage in a, in a human kind of way. Um, if, if that can be arranged. I mean, it, yes, it, it might be a bit of a chore and there are these four meetings a month out here and in other communities, but I just wonder whether that could be slipped into officers' diaries somehow. Okay. So um, if when I share the email addresses, if you um, want to come back with the relevant dates, I can explore those. I can't make a commitment that we can attend all because of course it's subject to inches of duty. But um, it doesn't strike me as beyond the realms of possibility that um, you can have attendance, even if it's not to everyone. But if you send me the dates, I can double check, see who the right person would be to go to that. And then I can get back, back in touch with you. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Inspector. I have Councillor Anne Barnaby to ask a question next, please. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Um, yes, and thank you very much. Um, welcome to the Vale of Morgan. Um, I was, it's basically just to, to, to confirm what um, the last councillor just brought up. In, I'm a community councillor in St Athen and we used to regularly have police uh, representation at our meetings and in actual fact I actually thanked a previous chief inspector at one of these meetings and within probably the next two months we it, they seem to cease <laughs> so it was a bit of bad timing because we used to get somebody at every meeting uh, with a brief report on any issues in the area and um, that that stopped some time ago and while I appreciate 
I wouldn't expect it during these times with COVID, but perhaps once everything settles down, it would be good if we could sort of uh, reconstruct those uh, regular community meetings with a local police representative. Thank you. Fabulous, thanks, Councillor. I think my answer would be much the same as to Councillor Morgan to say if um, if we can share across the details, and I suppose broadly on if we've got other councillors listening on the call who are thinking that we used to have that representation, we would like to see it back. If if those details can be shared, then I can look at the number and the achievability. I can't make a commitment that we can make all of them, but I, I don't see why we can't at least make some of them um, or make them periodically. So if I can have the details then I can take some steps with the teams to see um, how we can facilitate that. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. I can't see any more questions in the chat function or raised hands. So it just leaves me to say thank you very much, Chief Inspector, for your report and answering our questions. And we look forward to seeing you next month, hopefully. And you're more than welcome to leave now. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Pleasure. Bye bye. Um, moving on to agenda number five, um, fire and rescue service matters. Have we got Chris Hadfield with us this evening? Chris is operations manager for the South Wales Fire and Rescue. Are you there, Chris? I don't believe he's connected in yet, Chairman. Um, I have been trying to contact him, but haven't heard anything yet. So I wonder if you would mind moving on to the next agenda item and I'll update you after that. OK, yes. So we move on to agenda item six, <coughs> which is a matter of consideration by the committee um, from St Athen Community Council. I think you have it's, it's the future capacity of community services. Um, so we have who is presenting this report, Amy? Um, you have several officers with you this evening, Chair. Um, internally for the Vale of Glamorgan, you have um, Charlotte Rain, who has appeared on screen for you. Um, and you also have Matthew Curtis, and I believe Victoria Robinson is also on the line. Um, and then externally, you have Lisa Dunsford from the um, University Health Board is also with us. Um, so I believe I'll leave it up to the officers because they do have presentation slides to share. Um, so I believe they've probably got a natural running order of who wants to go first with regards to those. OK, thank you. Um, who wants to go first? Matthew? Charlotte? Yeah, thank you. And um, if I go first, I'll just share my screen now. OK, so I'll provide an overview of um, future capacity of community services. Um, just as an overview from the planning perspective, um, because I think the um, query stems around the local development plan and future housing developments in the area. And then I'll move on. To, uh, Matthew will um, provide an overview of education, as I know this was a specific matter that was raised. And then Lisa will follow with um, some additional slides with regards to health um, and health provision. So I just want to double check. Can you see the slideshow? Yes, I can see it. Brilliant. OK. To provide an overview then, um, I, I hope that you're all aware um, of the um, planning hierarchy um, from previous sessions that I've attended. Um, but um, the key document for us in the Vale of Glamorgan is the, uh, the Vale of Glamorgan Council's adopted local development plan. And then that's supported by supplementary planning guidance. Above that, there is um, legislation in place around Section 106 and what we can use Section 106 agreements for, and also um, stipulations within the community infrastructure levy regulations in terms of reasonable planning obligations. Um, in terms of um, it provides parameters of what is reasonable in terms of di di directly related to developments. Um, and then um, there's a national planning policy hierarchy as well um, at Welsh Government level. But the key document for us is our adopted local development plan and supplementary planning guidance. 
So just to provide an overview, um, some of you are probably very familiar with it, um, but there is a written statement, which um, is the core document for the development plan, which provides um, a vision and objectives, um, which is supported with a strategy and strategic policies, managing growth policies, and then managing development policies. Each year, we then also provide an annual monitoring report, and that provides an update on the progress in relation to those policies. Um, and just it, it, it goes into some detail into trigger points and thresholds of what we're meeting throughout the plan period and delivery. It looks at delivery of infrastructure as well as um, growth, employment growth, housing growth, etc. If I look now at the local development uh, plan managing growth policies. This is the allocations within the plan. And in addition to housing allocations, there are a number of infrastructure and other community related allocations. And these have been these policies were developed before before the adoption of the local development plan and in the preparation of the adoption of the local development plan. Um, based upon detailed infrastructure planning and detailed background papers were uh, went into some detail with regards to topic areas that assess the impacts and needs arising from new housing developments. And through those background documents, a number of allocations have been um, made. So for, in addition to the housing allocations that the, the majority are familiar with, there are also educational allocations, there's community facility allocations, health, employment, transport proposals, public open space, etc. So in terms of when we're actually looking at new developments and um, the key policy for assessing community one of the key policies for looking at community infrastructure and planning obligations is policy MD4. So this is this assists us to manage that development and look at the mitigation measures that may be necessary to deliver that development. So it looks at infrastructure facilities and services appropriate to the scale and type of the new development. Now, this policy is supported by a series of supplementary planning guidance documents. So, for example, the affordable housing um, matters are covered in a specific supplementary planning guidance. And then there's also a specific planning guidance on general planning obligations. So that looks at um, affordable housing, education, community facilities, etc. And this planning obligations guidance provides us with detailed uh, policy and provides clarification on where, what, when and how, how we will seek planning obligations for major developments. And for, I, I provided a few examples here of uh, small scale um, developments um, post the development using Section 106 contributions. So um, in Firm Gok, we've done um, footpath improvements as a result of a, a relatively minor development of 40 units. Um, we've uh, implemented a new play area in Colwinston using Section 106 money, a new nursery at Wick and Marcross uh, Primary School as a result of the development in Wick, and then a series of um, footpath and uh, bus shelter improvements in Ashtodowan. Now, I know the key focus that was raised today was with regards to education and health. So I've looked at these in a bit more detail and I'll pass over to Matt in a minute. Um, but as I said, in terms of education, um, back in 2013, um, an education's background paper was um, prepared, which fully considered um, all schools serving each development site. And it identified where demand cannot be met by existing school capacity and where there was a need for a new, new schools in their entirety and extensions or improvements to existing schools based upon pupil projections. There was land specifically allocated for new schools or improvements to schools. And I've just noted the policy there below, um, MG6. Now, some of these are already implemented and some are already in the pipeline to be delivered. So, for example, Panath Learning Community was undertaken a couple of years ago. Um, Landswick Major and the reorganisation there was undertaken a couple of years ago. And then um, Land has been secured at Darham Farm um, for a new primary school there. Same with Barry Waterfront, um, preparatory work is being undertaken there, etc. etc. And a number of schemes are also um, 
projected um, or have been implemented for existing schools to be extended to meet the future demand for school places during the plan period. Um, Matt, I think this is where you come in. Yeah, thanks, Charlotte. Um, so yeah, so where Charlotte works for um, within the planning department, I work within the learning and skills directorate. So um, specifically, I work within the 21st century schools team. So working on major projects, um, but also generally on on school organisation functions. So we work really closely together because obviously the two go hand in hand because our school organisation strategy and way forward is influenced um, by the local development planning and the housing allocations around the Vale. Um, so we work closely with planning in the development of the local development plan, but we also work very closely on an individual application by application process um, progress. So um, we are consulted as part of the process um, and we review the impact of that housing development on the educational facilities that serve that area. Um, so what we use is calculations and formula that are within the supplementary planning guidance. There's a link on this on this when it comes out. Um, for you to have a look at. So that provides a formula that will help us determine the number of pupils that will come from a housing development. We then use that formula to start our work um, to establish whether we can meet demand from that development or whether there would be a shortfall as a result of that development. Where a shortfall is identified, we would look to then secure Section 106 contributions and we would provide evidence um, to Charlotte and the planning team um, so they can carry on those negotiations for those Section 106 contributions and those contributions will help us mitigate against that impact. Um, however, I do just want to note that um, identifying demand and projecting pupil numbers and school organisation in general is very complex. Um, there are a lot of different areas to look at and a lot of key considerations, so I've just noted them there. Um, so the first thing I've already mentioned, we need to look at the pupil yield, so the amount of pupils that can potentially come from a housing development, that's important. However, we can never underestimate the role that parental preference plays in our admissions process. Um, and we do have to take that into account. You can't always consider that the, all the pupils coming from that development will attend their local catchment school because that is far from the case of what actually happens um, in the Vale. Parents can choose any school they wish and under admissions codes, we're only able to apply the oversubscription criteria that ranks pupils based on where they live, mainly um, where schools are oversubscribed. So, to, so, so parental pre preference does influence our strategy. Um, we also need to look at trends. So what are the trends in terms of denominational education, Welsh medium, English medium? That's really important in determining the potential impact on local schools. We need to look at strategies and policies. So come right 2050, will there be a big shift in Welsh medium education? We've seen a big shift over the last 15 years in the Vale, um, and it's 20 odd years since Bro Morganog opened. Um, so you know, that trend is likely to continue and we need to factor that in. You need to look at the existing capacity of the school. So have they got surplus capacity? What's their current number on roll? But also more importantly, what is the composition of the pupils at that school? Are, you know, a school can be full, but 50% of those pupils could be out of catchment applications. Some of them could be out of county. You need to consider that as well within the, as part of the process. Um, we also need to consider building condition. Is it a good quality building that's local serving that development or is it one that needs investment? Um, what is the current size? Because the capacity could be one thing, but actually there could be spaces um, that we've actually taken out of that school or used for alternative purposes. So to use the example of why this was um, asked to be considered at this meeting in St. Athens, that school previously had an admission number that's higher than their current admission number. We haven't taken away any physical part of that school. We've just redesignated areas and we do have to consider that because those areas can sometimes be brought back into use to increase the capacity. Um, we also need to look at the catchment. Is the catchment likely to change? Have we introduced any changes to the catchment area recently um, which might influence future parental preference? Um, and we also need to look at the, pu the level of funding is dependent on the number of pupils coming from the development. Can we do anything meaningful with that amount of money? Can we actually deliver a project that will really influence, that will really change the capacity? And then we also need to look at whether there are additional funding streams we can match up with that section 106 to maximise the investment. So can we look at Welsh Government funding, other pots or capital receipts, that sort of thing. We go to the next slide, please. 
Great. So then all of that kind of feeds into our school investment then. So we do the school organisation work first to identify the projects that are needed and where the kind of demand is, and then you can develop that into a school investment proposal. Um, so we have some different kind of main streams here uh, of where that funding comes from. So 21st century schools is the one I spent most of my time working on, and that's our major um, school investment programme. Um, so that is where we do our major projects, our new builds, our refurbishments, um, those sort of things. And that is part funded by Welsh Government, depending on the individual scheme. Um, we also have maintenance funding that we can access, so we allocate funding each year to asset renewal to contribute to maintaining our schools. We also provide schools with revenue funding to maintain their buildings. And then, of course, as we've discussed here, we have Section 106 contributions that can also fit into that um, to create our school investment. So in terms of the previous big investment programmes that we've delivered in the Vale, Panath Learning Community, the creation of Saint, um, Saint, the new build for St. Cyrus and Escaladere was, you know, a major 50 million pounds investment in the um, eastern area of the Vale. Um, we also had Band Day of the 21st Century Schools programme that finished in 2019. That was totaling £32 million. And again, the one that I spend most of my time on at the moment is Band B of the 21st Century Schools programme, which will see up to £167 million invested in our school buildings between April 2019 and um, 2020, April 2024. Um, and, you know, a big chunk of that work has already started and is progressing really, really well. I was today, spent most of my day at um, Whitmore High School, which is complete. The build is complete now and in the process of being transferred over to the school. So next week, the children will be in that new um, building that um, is a £30.5 million investment. And if we could switch over to the next one. So again, just to kind of elaborate further on that, here are some of the examples. I won't go through them all, but you know, the, the slides will be shared and you can have a little look, but it just shows the level of investment that has been made across the Vale over the last 10 years, um, from Cowbridge Comprehensive School to St. David's and Clancarvon schools that are currently on site being constructed. Smaller schemes that are mainly more Section 106 funded, like St. Bride's providing them with nursery provision. Um, Whitmore High School, Pencoitra High School, Bro organic scheme in Barry, you know, it's a major £87 million scheme across those three schools. Um, we've also got the new Centre for Learning and Wellbeing that we're looking to put on the Court Road Depot. We've appointed a contractor to start the design of that one and we'll be hoping to go through the planning process soon. Um, and then in the East Ville, we have Penarth Learning Community. Um, St Andrew's Major had some Section 106 funding allocated to them to increase their, um, to provide additional space. Um, and we also have future schemes coming through the pipeline in the next couple of years as well. And then the last slide from me then, I believe, just has a couple of pictures of those investments. So Penarth Learning Community at the bottom, the new Cowbridge Comprehensive Building just in the middle left, um, and then at Oakfield Primary School on the middle right. And then on the top two, we have Escola Drag and um, Escola Dairy Sand, which were the two new built primary schools that were provided as part of Lantwit Learning Community. Thanks, Matt. Um, in terms of the second query that was raised, and this was in relation to health provision, and um, just before I introduce um, Lisa, I just wanted to provide a bit of background and context then from a Vale of the Morgan Council perspective. Um, so in terms of the consultation with the Health Board, um, prior to the adoption of the LDP, um, they were consulted on a, with the um, Deposit Local Development Plan and the individual sites. Um, they're also consulted upon on individual planning applications and um, Victoria Robinson, the operational manager for planning and building control, also attends um, regular meetings and provides updates to the health board with regards to the progress of developments coming forward within the Vale of Glamorgan. Um, just as a bit of an overview, really, that Section 106 cannot support revenue funding, so it cannot support sort of everyday costs associated with um, health. Um, and then the final slide, if it works. Um, LDP policies then in relation to health, um, MG8 and M MD4 are relevant. So um, both policies support new or enhanced health facilities and um, there's suitable provision in the LDP to support proposals put forward by the health board subject to the detail. 
Um, the planning policy team are currently drafting supplementary planning guidance on healthy placemaking and they have been working quite closely with the health board in that respect. And we do have a current pending application at Penarth Leisure Centre for a wellbeing hub. It hasn't been determined yet, um, which is looking to consider Redlands surgery, Albert Road surgery and um, uh, surgery in Stanwell Road. Um, that's probably it from me with regards to health. Um, Lisa? Yeah, good evening, everyone. So just bear with me while I pull my slides up. OK, I can't see the screen. So are you able to see um, my slide deck? We, I we can, can see can that, see yeah. It. We can see it, Lisa. Would you be able to, could you put it in slideshow mode just to make it a bit bigger for us? Yeah, I'm just clicking on that now. That's lovely, it's showing now, yeah. Okay, it's not showing on my screen, but that's fine. I've got a hard copy in front of me. It seems to have disappeared uh, for me. OK, now I've got it back. So just to introduce myself then, so I'm Lisa Dunsford, the Director of Operations, and I've got responsibility for the Primary Community and Intermediate Care Clinical Board. So basically in relation to all primary and community services, so I would describe that as out of hospital care, then that sort of is my area. What um, I have done because I know the matter for the agenda item today was raised by St Athan Community Council. So I have focused primarily on um, the Western Vale in the early slides and then I've sort of included reference to why to work later on. But again, uh, Chair, I'm happy to answer any wider questions that um, councillors and others may have. So on the first slide then, again, the request was in relation to GP provision. So I'm sure colleagues in Western Vale will know this, but in terms of the population size, just under 30,000 patients, um, they are served by three practices working from seven sites. So I've listed the practices there. Um, two of them operate out of the Cowbridge Health Centre, so Cowbridge and Vale and Western Vale. And then we've also got two who are classed as training practices, which again is a sort of key thing for us within primary care in terms of the provision of service and sustainability. So they are the latter two, Lantwood Major and Coastal Vale and the Western Vale practice. So in terms of the, the areas covered by the cluster that's shown there on the slide, um, I will go on to the next slide, which will show this in a little bit more detail. But as Charlotte mentioned in relation to the LDP, in terms of the population growth and number of homes, that would be just under 2000 homes. Um, and with sort of a population size of just under 4,400, but it will show a breakdown on the next slide there. Um, in the same way as Charlotte you, and colleagues. Sorry, Lisa. Yeah. Kevin Thomas, Slattered Major. Your slides are not changing. Is it a problem? Right, it's changed on mine. So I'm on slide two on mine. You can't see that. Can I'm, you? Still, I'm still on slide one. Right, is that the same for everyone else? Yes, yeah. Right, okay. Lisa, if you bear with me one moment, let me see, let me share your slides for you. And then as you're going through, you can just let me know when you'd like to switch. Right, so um, shall I come back yes, in? Yes, if you, if you stop sharing down. and bear me one second and I'll share my screen now. Yeah, and I, I stayed in the office just to make sure there wasn't issues with me sharing. So apologies, I don't know why that didn't move on because I was on slide two. That's OK. No problem. Just bear me one second because I just need to open them up. I found that sometimes it helps if um, I if we share through the VOG system. So just bear me one second. Thank you.
great. So yeah, so I was on slide two. That's lovely. Thanks so much. So the slide is sort of covers what I was saying, but going on to the um, the cluster and the population growth, I'd said there was sort of um, just under 2,000 new houses planned, and that would be just under 4,400 population. So what that would mean then is that in terms of the practices and the cluster, they would look at that in terms of what capacity they've currently got and come to some assessment. And we would have a conversation with them at the health board, whether they have got the capacity to manage the growth. So, uh, and there is confirmation that that is the case. Um, I've flagged up, I haven't got um, any pictures of things, but I just wanted to flag up then that there has been, there was funding provided for Cowbridge a few years ago to have that new surgery and we've just had approval for funding from Welsh Government to develop Plantwit Major and Coastal Vale Medical Practice and I think that completion work is planned for March 2022. So if we go on to the next slide, that was just showing the breakdown in terms of the number of homes proposed. So the just under 2000 homes and just under 4,400 population. So as I say, in terms of the GP practices capacity, um, we've had the dialogue and assurance that that can be managed with the existing practices. Uh, as I say, I've mentioned the funding to improve um, Plantwood Major and Coastal Vale. And in relation to Cowbridge, whilst that was built a few years ago, then actually there is capacity there. There's a sort of a floor vacant, and that was as a result of mental health services moving to Barry. Chair, I'm conscious there's, a, there's hands up. Do, do you want me to pause for questions or do you want me to continue? I've only got three more slides. Yeah, we, if you continue and we'll take the um, questions at the end, please. Yeah, of course. Thank you. So that slide was just showing the breakdown. If we can move on then to the next slide, please. OK, so in terms then um, of that, so our message was there's the capacity there. I just wanted to highlight, obviously, the last 12 months or so have been quite challenging. So from the health board's perspective, we've been working with the practices to make sure that they have been able to respond to the pandemic. Because they're independent contractors, a lot of the um, services provided do get erected by Welsh Government. So some things would have been paused to give practices the capacity to deal with COVID. Um, another thing that we have been looking at as well, because I think the old fashioned model for general medical services is about the doctor model. We've been very keen within the health board that we actually look at a multidisciplinary team using different practitioners. So again, colleagues may be familiar with the sort of mental health physio services that we've been putting in place. Um, we have introduced, this was um, December last year, the, um, sorry, I've jumped a bullet, but the Western Vale and Primary Care model. So that does now mean for the whole of the Vale, we've got additional capacity, which again is good for people and patients. There's extra capacity to deal with the urgent issues. And what that does then mean is that the GPs are able to deal with those people who may need more continuity of care, people with chronic conditions. Um, we have done, I mean, we, I can't go without talking about mass immunisation. So um, again, whilst we've had the mass vac centres, whilst we've had our GP practices delivering the vaccinations, we did introduce um, colleagues from Western Vale were very keen to support us in the health board. So we have introduced the local vaccination centre there. And then in terms of the wider work, um, I would like to think people will have heard of CAV 247. So this is about people not turning up at the emergency department in UHW, about people ringing first and we can book them in. And also as part of that work, we were able to reopen the Barry MIU. And then the final point on this one, which again um, has been paused really due to COVID, but um, our strategy sets out the development of three health and wellbeing centres. 
um, Charlotte mentioned Panath earlier on and the wellbeing hubs. So if we just move on to the final slide and just bear in mind, this is a little bit of a busy slide, but in terms of the plans for the health and wellbeing centres and wellbeing hubs, um, that was the timeline in 2019, uh, but in relation to the Western Vale and the wellbeing hub there, that was going to be in phase or tranche three. So they were just a few quick slides, but Chair, obviously there may be questions for me and Charlotte and others. So that's the end of the presentation. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much, Lisa. That was very informative. Can I also thank Charlotte and Matthew for your presentation? And can I open it up now for any questions? I'll take Town and Community Council questions first and Vale councillors after that. So can I um, ask Councillor Anne Barnaby who put this question forward? Thank you, Anne. And would you like to ask your question? Yes, thank you, Chair, Chair, and thank you very much to the presenters, especially, you know, giving up some of your personal time in the evening and especially as I'm sure you've all been very busy with with the COVID situation, uh, particularly Lisa. Um, my um, first of all, if I could start with Lisa, I, I'd like to thank you very much for specifically giving us some figures um, regarding the capacity and also that little bit more focus on the Western Vale, uh, because sometimes I do think that gets missed. Um, my only concern would be would be your numbers, um, because my question was relating quite a lot to, to the 1250 houses planned for St, between St Athan and Boverton, um, which weren't, I don't think, in your your actual your summary of the houses you're expecting. Um, we've got 250 currently being built at Eggis Brewis. Um, we've got another 485 planned in St Athen itself in the LDP. Um, and then another 465 along the Northern Access Road, which I did, do think you did mention. So I do think, um, which is, this is really one of the highest concerns um, that all our residents bring up every time a new housing development is mentioned. How is the capacity? How We can't get a doctor's appointment today. How on earth is we going to get a doctor's appointment in the future? Um, the waiting lists and so forth. So it was good to see the figures and the fact that there is some investment coming to the Lantwick Major surgeries. Um, but it's not just about buildings, it's capacity. So that's people. Um, it's the doctor's availability to actually be able to um, to look after the, the local residents as far as um, the health is concerned. Um, shall I just concentrate on uh, with Lisa's report or shall I, if I can just mention um, the whole, um, as I mentioned then, the matter this came up was because it's such a high point to our residents, our communities, and education is also there. Um, I was disappointed that I didn't, we didn't see any figures from education. Um, your current capacity in the Lantwick Major schools and Snathan schools and what um, your potential is within the current sites. That I know we've had some good investment um, in the last 10 years, but um, as I've just mentioned there, um, we've got uh, 1,250 houses potentially. I didn't agree with the LDP um, inspector um, stopping the veil, putting in timelines for the development. Um, they used to, they were originally in, in yearly segments, but now it, they could literally all be built tomorrow. And as far as I can see, the houses seem to go up within six months building a school takes a few more years than that. So I, I was hoping to see some figures, the current capacity and where you feel you need to be with capacity over the next few years. Um, one last thing on education, I believe on the current building that's going on in St Athen for the 250 houses, there is 106 money for education, but we don't know where that's going. And there is a concern in the village, it's going towards building the school in Barry, 
rather than actually supplying places to local residents. Uh, we have had people mention um, in in the area that uh, they were um, house house. Uh, this was back um, a year or so ago that house sales fell through because they were told that although their house the house potentially was in Sigginston in Cowbridge area, they actually was children would have to travel to Barry to school. So that's something else that's sort of um, been a focus for community. So um, answers to those would be very welcome. Thank you. And thank you again. I, I think, shall I, shall I just provide a bit of an overview and then Lisa and then Matt, would that help? Um, so I can provide Lisa with um, the up-to-date figures for St Athen and Lantwit in terms of where we are with plan and permissions, occupations, etc. More than happy to provide that in order to feed into your data. We do do an annual monitoring report for the local development plan, which provides all that information. Work has started already on the next one, which will be published September, October time. But we've already started consolidating that information, so I can provide that to you so you've got the absolute latest position. In terms of um, education, um, I can uh, uh, all, um, I can update you on that matter specifically, and if you'd like me to in St Athen and um, Landswit Major, and um, we had prepared slides specifically for St Athen and Landswit, and then we recognised that this was for all community and town councillors, so we scaled it back to being more general. So more than happy to have those conversations um, with the specific town and community councils about that. Um, Lisa, do you have anything further to add? Yeah, so thanks, Charlotte. So I was going to say they were the figures I had. I know in terms um, of the position and Charlotte, you mentioned the monitoring reports that we are trying to link in now with the teams because both in terms of what's planned uh, and we'll get those numbers right so I can correct that and obviously discuss with our practices that they have got the capacity for that and as you said the timeline in terms of what's happening when so we'll, we'll link in on that um, and the other query for me then was around the access to doctors and waiting lists so for me that's why I did try and share some of the other work that we are doing so it's about people being seen in the right place at the right time so the different models if people need to be seen by a physio they are seen through that route and I do think that the additional capacity for urgent primary care um, I didn't flag that when I talked about that on the slide but that would be capacity for 160 patients per week for the Western Vale and we have got that in um, Central and Eastern Vale as well. So I'll certainly take the latest figures from Charlotte, we'll work that through. But what we are trying to do is to put other things in place to free up the GP's time and where people need to see someone else, that's what we're putting in place. So hopefully that does cover the points. Thank you. Oh. Uh, Matt, I don't know whether you've got anything else to add in terms of education generally. Yeah, I was just going to agree with you, Charlotte. You know, we pulled the data together specifically on the on, on the St. Athen area, but then we realised that to make it interesting and informative for all members, we did make it more general. So it was it, it was more of a general overview. So the data on the capacity of all of the schools in the area, we've got all our information together. We've got the projections together and the pupil yields and happily linking with you directly to share that information with the community council after the meeting. Okay. Is that OK, Anne? Yes, that'd be fine. Um, just one. Is there a, would it is it possible for an overview on what the 106 money for yeah. the current development is going towards? Yeah, so um, the development at Land off Cowbridge Road, St Athen, is a very specific Section 106 agreement um, and the contributions are specific for the needs that were identified at the planning application stage and in the officer's report. Um, so it, I've got those in front of me now. It's 500,000 to St Athen Primary, um, just shy of 700,000 to Wick and Marcross Primary and 1.4 million to Landswick Major Comprehensive. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure whether where the Barry rumours have come from because that's not accurate at all. That's fine. So it's, it's Cowbridge though. Did you say Cowbridge? The, no, the, the site land off Cowbridge Road, the um, Eglis Brewis lands the east of Eglis Brewis and uh, in yes. St Athen, the one that yes. are currently built. No, I meant the one point, sorry, the 1.4 million 
Yeah, that's the Landsmit Major Comp, which is the secondary oh, school service in Athen. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. OK, thank you, um, Councillor Barnaby. Can I move on and ask Councillor Chris Tatt to ask his question, please? You're muted at the moment, that's it. All right, thank you, Chair. Um, it's, uh, the, we had three officers talk to us for 25 minutes without addressing the agenda item. The agenda item is request for consideration from Athens Community Council. It was only when the council of course in Athens came on do we actually know what we were dealing with. Shouldn't it be the other way around that the, when we asked, you know, when the committee is asked to consider a request, we know what we're considering before the officers speak for so long. And then the officers would have the chance to be much more specific in addressing the issues that the councillor raised. Um, you know, they would be able to tell her where her request does or does not conform with the three policies that they outlined. I think Charlotte Rain uh, actually sort of touched on this when she spoke, but um, I, d I listened very closely and I, I was, comp I must admit, I was lost on what we were dealing with until Councillor and St Athens came on. I appreciate what you're saying, um, Mr Tapp, but obviously the request for consideration is set out in the papers in advance. Um, and, and, and obviously th that is the request in its entirety as received from, from Ms Barnaby. And obviously the officers have responded as requested on the request for consideration. Thank you, Amy, for clarifying that. Um, I will take your point on board, um, Councillor. Um, can I ask Councillor uh, Gwyn John, John to ask to his ask. question, please? And thank you very much, uh, Madam Chairman. Uh, I'm not a member of the committee, but I need your permission to speak on this, uh, please. I'm happy for you to go ahead, Councillor. Thank you very much. Um, I, I'm not going to speak about education tonight because I asked a question of Councillor Lisbon at the Cabinet member last night, and we've talked about it again today. So uh, that will continue uh, with Councillor Burnett. But I do have concerns about um, the report tonight that Lisa has given us on the medical services. It's a very impressive report, but it looks good on paper until you come to practice. And the Western uh, Vail Service uh, at Ladrid Major works out of the clinic and the building is in very poor condition. It's over 50 year old and I have dealt with the Western Vale Clinic now for about six years at different times, and they need a new building. There's no question about that. The recent uh, vaccination program, they didn't operate a vaccination program from Landred Major in the Western Vale Clinic, and they had to travel to Cowbridge. So the elderly patients had to hire taxis. Again, that was totally unsatisfactory and an expensive, expensive operation for the older generation. Coming on to the Coastal Vale, the Coastal Vale and I uh, do not see eye to eye, and I'm leading the campaign in Landred Major at the moment for a health centre to be based on Eagleswell School Old Site. Basically, I've had over 3,000 people support me so far, and I'm currently setting up a petition, which I hope to double that number. I met uh, Len Richards of the Health Board, and I've also dealt with Jane Hutt on three occasions about this, and I know uh, Jane Hutt has spoken to Mr Richards recently, before the elections were called. But what my problem on the Coastal Vale is I get a number of people complain to me about the lack of appointments and how they get appointments. And I support Anne Barnaby tonight wholeheartedly because I know the problems that people face. Furthermore, I understand totally with COVID, it's been difficult for everyone. But the people in Landred Major, it's more difficult because if they want blood tests, they have to travel to St Athen. It's fine for people with cars, and I must say the surgery in St Athens is excellent to serve people and is well organised. But 
the elderly generation again, and there's over 2,000 in Lantwit living, they have to hire a taxi. That costs a £12 round trip to St Athens from Lantwit Major. Quite simply, it's still going on and it's quite unacceptable that people have to pay this amount out of their weekly pensions for health care. Going on from there, people that are having an appointment at Coastal Vale, they go along for their appointment after speaking to the doctor and they wait outside. They have to wait outside in all winds and weathers and I've had loads of complaints from people getting drenched before being allowed into the surgery. The system is simple. You stand outside until the doctor is ready to receive you and the doctor comes out and invites you in. And that's the way it works. Now they've had extra money allocated. That's obviously for the current surgery because they haven't got the space to expand there, at least unless they've bought some land off the Poundfield car park. But what I would say, today I had another complaint about Coastal Vale. A lady this afternoon phoned me up, absolutely furious. Her husband had taken time off work today to have his COVID vaccination. He went to GVS for his vaccination. It was closed and there was a lot of other people standing outside, bewildered why they were left outside and nobody. So subsequently, the lady phoned the surgery to be told, you don't expect us to let you know when we can't do it, can you? Now this is simply impossible. And it's time the health board woke up to the way people are being treated in Lantwit Major. They're not happy. You'll talk to Mrs Proctor and she'll tell you everybody is delighted. The people that are delighted are the ones that get their appointments and are getting the treatment. I have solved the problem. I email them when I want an appointment now and I get an appointment because I'm a county councillor and they don't beat about the bush with me. But quite simply, the elderly generation in Lantwit Major are not being treated as they should be treated. It was a very impressive presentation. As a county councillor, I was involved from day one with your plans for the Penarth Leisure Centre. I was absolutely amazed today to see that the scheme is still going on. And I was involved in this in 2013. So where you've been for the last eight years just beats me. Quite honestly, I am always supporting health. I support the clinical changes in the reshaping of the clinical services. But if we are going to be able to feed into that clinical services, we need a health centre in Lantwit Major to serve the population of Lantwit Major, St Athen and Roos, which the current surgeries cover. And you're fully aware of that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chairman, for letting me speak. OK, so if I pick up on some of those questions. So again, Councillor John, I know we had this conversation in August 2019. So I came to the meeting with um, yourself, Jane Hett, obviously with Len Richard. So just a few things then. Um, if there are any access issues, um, because we haven't been None of that has been flagged with our team. I've spoken to my team today and similarly, what I can confirm is the Community Health Council are very quick to contact me. They've got my personal mobile if there are any issues. So more than happy, Councillor John, if you've got specific issues, um, I can share my email address. I'm more than happy to pick that up outside. I will pick up the issue around the vaccinations as well and the surgery being closed. Sorry, so do you want to come back in? I just wanted to mention, I have emailed Len Richards' email address with my complaints that I've had recently. I've sent the emails over to him. Recently, I've sent the email from uh, Mrs Knight, who waited outside in the pouring rain for a quarter of an hour. Again, she was furious going in there, but they said, oh, well, we can't let you in. Well, surely people that people, they can let people in in St. Athens sit in two metres apart. 
in Lantrid Major, they can't do it. OK, no they problem. It impossible. I'll contact Len Richards' office so I can pick up on those and I, I'll pick those up and respond to you on the specific yeah. ones. Um, in terms of the building, um, again, for the record, the GPs are independent contractors. Um, we were having the conversations at the time, you recall, whether they were going to buy the building. We did meet with them. That sort of wasn't the case. They took back the view about buying the building and talked about refurbishment. Uh, and again, completely hear what you say and you mentioned the specific site at the school. Um, but we will be looking. I know you and Jane Hutt at the time did speak about the wellbeing hub um, being in Llantwit, but for that there will be a formal process around the engagement consultation. Where should that be? That is some time off. The Panath one has been delayed. Um, you know, there's conversations ongoing between the health board and the local authority, and we are looking at other options, but agree it is disappointing that that has been um, delayed as well. So what I will do, Councillor John, if you're OK, I will pick up on the correspondence you've sent to Len Richards. But if there is anything else, I'm more than happy to be contacted and we will look in because our job with the practices is to make sure where people have got the access. So the one final point which I've mentioned to other councillors has been around the access standards that were introduced by Welsh Government. Um, this was something that I felt would be more transparent in terms of how long people would need to wait for services. But during COVID, that was suspended, OK? But the access standards are there. But I know I can see Councillor Wilson, you know, we've talked about this before, but we will be reporting when they reinstate that there will be visible transparent information for each of our 60 practices across Cardiff and Vale. So hopefully that's OK, but I'll pick stuff outside the meeting and get back to you with your queries. Thank you, Lisa. Can I move may on? I, Sorry. May I yeah. have, uh, if uh, Lisa would leave the email address with you tonight, if I could have the email address of Lisa's, then I can or direct in future and not to Lenny Richards. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Can I call on Councillor Wilson to ask his question, please? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for the presentations. Um, very illuminating about the Western Vale. But I can tell you in Eastern Vale, we do suffer similar issues as well. Um, probably not as bad, to be quite honest with you, because we're much nearer to Cardiff and we much nearer to a greater centre population. And come centre population, of course, comes the economies of scale. But nevertheless, there are issues there that are, are that are reoccurring. I mean, notably that we are coming out of some sort of lockdown. We're now going into phase two, my understanding is. And I have seen some of the latest legislation that's been recently um, passed, which does make it a lot easier for things to occur. And what I want to make sure here is that things go back to normal in quotation match as, as quickly as possible. I am very concerned still about the access to health care and how long it takes to, to get a consultation and the number of processes that are going through. I know that in the Vale Glamorgan at the moment, cases of COVID are very, very low, sometimes less than 10 a day and sometimes three or four a day. And I think we need to look at that context here and we need, do need to move on. And the vast majority of people in, in our hospitals are not suffering from COVID, they're suffering from other issues. And what I want to really make sure if those services are restored as much as possible, and clearly that is not happening as fast as I would like. Um, and certainly there are issues still, not just in general practices, but also in dental surgeries as well, which I know are causing concern to my constituents and it is a real a real issue. Um, and the other thing I also think that we need to be working on is transport. Um, I mean, Councillor John rightly made the point about the lack of transport available in the Western Bell. And yet we do have metro plans. And I do think we need to work on those metro plans quicker than we are at the moment. Certainly I want to know a lot more about what's going on in Kogan, for example especially if the hub is going to occur in that area. Whether it is or not, I really don't know. And I couldn't say if I knew anyway, because I don't know. 
Um, so I think that's something that does need to be looked at is public transport accessibility. If public transport is not very accessible, then any new hubs need to be in the centre of populations and not so much in the outskirts. And that's my feeling is at the moment that um, we need a place where people can get to where there's good public transport connections. And because we've all got to work together on this. I mean, to be honest, there are structures available where we can discuss these things. Perhaps the public service boards perhaps should perhaps, you know, look at this, these sort of issues because these issues are very strategic. And I do think that that's very important. But I think, think, I think you're right. We do need to have that discussion more with planning, education and help and social services. So we have a lot more joined up thinking. Thank you. Are you happy for me to come in on the health related ones first of all then? Um, so Councillor Wilson, I know we've had a number of discussions outside of this forum, so I'm obviously aware of some of your concerns around the access and again, um, happy to pick things up outside the meeting. What I probably did want to pick up on though was the return to normal. Um, so I mentioned earlier in my slide that in terms of the contractor services, um, that gets directed by Welsh Government. Interestingly, last week I was at a national call, so the directors of primary care in each of the other health boards. I'm picking up on your point around the lower prevalence um, in the community settings. Whilst it has been right and proper to triage, to deal with things over the phone where that's appropriate and then to save the appointments for those things that should be face to face. I think the collective view across all health boards is we do start to need to see that return to normality. Some things may not go back to exactly how they were. So that's something we are raising at the national level and as part of our recovery plans within the health board councillor, we will look to pick that up. So again, completely agree with you um, on that point. Um, I think the other stuff we probably covered previously, but hopefully that's OK um, for this evening. Lovely. Thank you, Lisa. Um, can I have the next question from Councillor Carroll, please? Um, good evening. It's a quick question, basically, on something that was touched on in the presentation relating to policy MG8. I'm the Bail of Glamorgan Councillor for the Landock Board, and I obviously note the um, expansion of the hospital. It's a question really in relation to when expansion goes ahead. Could we make sure that sufficient infrastructure is put in place to allow for access onto and out of the hospital site and to ensure that there's sufficient parking um, provision on site? I'm not sure whether um, many people in this meeting will be aware of the pressures that at the moment exist from users of the hospital parking in residential areas. And really, it's just a plea as much as, in, as anything, as if to say, by and large, residents do accept that we need to provide healthcare services, we need to provide first class healthcare services. And so they're not anti expansion, they just really want to make sure that sufficient facilities are put in place to ensure that any potential impacts that that expansion may have on the local community are mitigated. Yeah, I, I will take that away. Obviously, it's not my area, but what I will do is feedback to my other colleagues within the health board. So I'll take that away, Councillor Carroll. Just to add on that, that all of these matters would be considered as part of a planning application. So, um, everything that you've raised in terms of access, parking, etc. It would all be considered under other policies within the plan. You beat me to it, Charlotte. <laughs> Did you want to add anything, Victoria? No, that's fine. Like Charlotte says, you know, these matters are taken into account every time we deal with any any bit of development at Landock Hospital. We're very aware of the constraints there. Um, you know, I'm sure uh, many residents at New East Vale are also familiar with the constraints on other Cardiff and Vale sites like the Heath Hospital and, and other facilities. And so 
I'm, you know, I don't think any of us can envy the uh, health board's task of trying to provide sufficient facilities, uh, you know, on their constrained sites that they have. So, but we work with them um, with the Metlandoc Hospital to make sure that um, we try to manage, you know, the uh, the the traffic and congestion issues, the parking issues, which I'm sure we're all very familiar with, um, and try and do our best there to sort of improve capacity and encourage sustainable forms of transport and other means of transport, especially for staff who who may be more able to to use those than um, than um, perhaps people who are unwell or visiting hospital. But, um, you know, we, we continue to look at those every time we deal with planning applications there. Lovely. Thank you very much. Um, and moving on to Councillor Burnett, you had a question you'd like to ask? Thank you, Chair. No, I, I just wanted to um, add a little bit of clarification over some points that were made earlier. Um, first of all, um, I am really pleased to, to join today to listen to this report because actually St. Athen was the first area where we tried out community mapping. Um, and develop the community mapping toolkit from Creative for All Communities. And I believe that some uh, facilities in St. Athen were developed as a result of that. Um, secondly, um, I, I do have to, I think they've been very modest. If, I, if, they are, if they don't manage to negotiate the highest levels of Section 106 in Wales, it's certainly one of the highest. And so an awful lot of community facilities have been delivered as a result of the skills of, of our officers and Charlotte probably blush now but an awful lot of that is down to her um, and, and Vicky but in terms of um, school place planning uh, as Councillor John said he did ask um, a, a question at full council on Monday um, and, and when I was answering that I, I did you know revisit the cabinet report of the 22nd of March. We do one every year to do with allocation of places in the Vale and school catchment areas. And in that, there was specific consideration of the catchment area of, of Llantwit Major Comprehensive. And there was an adjustment made um, as a result to ensure that for the next six or seven years, there are sufficient places in that school. So the dual catchment area for Roos going to either Llantwit or Cowbridge was changed so that children from Roos now go to Cowbridge um, and there is sufficient place. Slight, slight um, tight area for a high birth year in 2022, but apart from that, sufficient capacity. This leads people to say, um, well, why is it that the school's full? Well, that's down to parental choice. Once you've allocated all places for the, um, the children within that catchment area, if there are any spaces left over, other, other parents can, from outside the catchment can exert parental choice and apply to fill those places. And when you have good schools like Llantwit Major, that's what happens. The other places are filled up with children from out of catchment. But there are at entry point, you know, and I said that, that means that if somebody moves into the area, um, not at sort of entry level, there, there might be an issue with getting a place. And so Sigginston was 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 um, quoted. Um, I, I actually was dealing with a case a, a couple of years ago to do with that. And it was exactly that. It was in year transfers into school. But what I will say is that um, as far as we can see for the next six or seven years, there is sufficient capacity in Llantwit Major Comprehensive. But we will continue to interrogate the data and we will continue to make sure that all our schools have sufficient capacity for their catchment areas. I just wanted to clarify that, Chair. Thanks very much. Thank you very much for doing that, uh, Councillor. Um, can I ask um, Councillor Robertson, you would like to ask a question? Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, uh, thank you for those presentations, uh, excellent presentations, uh, and congratulations to Charlotte, particularly for uh, uh, raising so so much 106 money. Uh, one of my concerns since I became a councillor was the uh, amount of development that was happening in the Vale of Glamorgan, as uh, uh, opposed to the amount of improvement of infrastructure. Now. I, I regard uh, education and the health services being part of the infrastructure of the Vale of Glamorgan. And 
what those presentations this evening have demonstrated to me is the amount of reliance that we are now placing on 106 money for infrastructure such as uh, health and education. Now, I'm a bit concerned that we're uh, chasing the dragon here, but basically the more development we get, the more 106 money we get, and therefore the more 106 money we get, the better we can, but we're, 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 on, we're, we're in a spiral. And I think uh, I have always thought of education and health as being the responsibility of central government and local government, not the, the not finance from developers, not from 106 money. I'm concerned that uh, we're going into a position where uh, we have to build more houses to get more 106 money to improve education and to improve our health facilities. That's not the right way to go. I'm very concerned about it. I think Matt would like to come in on, on education specifically. Yeah, great. If I could just touch on the kind of investment in education. I think I touched on it in the slides, but didn't go into any specific detail when I talked about the different mechanisms for our school investment strategy. Um, we certainly don't rely on Section 106 to, for, to fund our school investment strategy in any great proportion when you look at the overall mix of funding. We mainly just touched on that and, the, and, and how we calculate the Section 106 because that was the purpose for the request for consideration. Um, in terms of our overall school investment strategy, you know, just take an example of Band B of the 21st Century Schools program. It's 136 million pounds currently allocated to that in terms of capital funding. 77 million of that comes from Welsh government, so they do fund the vast majority um, of our kind of contribute of, of our overall school investment strategy. So most of our biggest kind of block of funding is comes from. Um, Welsh Government. Um, we also do rely on Section 106 funding, absolutely. That's a great thing to contribute because many times the reason why we're building new schools is because we want to meet demand for housing developments and that's what that funding is there for. Um, but we also um, manage a, a, a fund of capital receipts that we received by managing our education estate. Um, we use contribute some of the council's general capital funding um, in, in, in great amounts and we also use education capital reserves. Um, so we, there's, there's a lot of funding that contributes to our school investment strategy. Yes, Section 106 is one component of that and it is important when the reason is to meet demand because that is why we request it and that's what it's there to be spent for. Um, but absolutely, we are very good in the Council at, um, at tapping into additional funding streams and applying for funding through business cases. Um, and we have proven over and over again to Welsh Government that we do deliver, which always puts us in a good light when we apply for additional funding. Yeah, and just to add from the health perspective, again, similar process, we would submit business cases to the health and wellbeing centres would go through that business case process. In relation to primary care, as I said, they are independent contractors, some will own their own buildings, but on the slides I did talk about the improvement grant funding, which again would come from Welsh Government and then we would ask the primary care contractors to put proposals forward. So just to echo really what Matthew said, that would be the, the same for healthcare. Lovely. Thank you very Could much. Can I come back on that chair? Yes. Thank you. Very, very briefly. I'm just very concerned that we are getting into a situation where the uh, tail might be wagging the dog and uh, we might actually be uh, looking at uh, building more developments or allowing more developments so that we can uh, benefit from the 106 to sort out problems uh, uh, of a lack of finance coming from central government. Thank you. Chair, Victoria. could I come back on that one? Yes, Thank certainly. you. Um, only to say that the way in which we decide how much housing, um, for example, is needed in the Vale of Morgan in our local development plan is in no way led by um, uh, you know, potential funding that you might get through Section 106. It's entirely um, based on what housing need we have in our area based on population trends and demands, um, you know, which arise from obviously uh, natural um, increases in population, migration, economic um, activity and so on. But it's in no way connected to the um, 
you know the ability to to collect section 106 money um you know it it should be seen as something that is of benefit um to our communities because obviously it helps to deliver infrastructure improvements for both the new communities living in those houses but also for our existing communities through knock-on effects but um you know I can I can just assure members that that's not how we work out how much development is needed going forward. Thank you, Victoria. Lovely, thank you. And uh, Councillor Barnaby, did you was that a historic hand? No, yeah. thank you. It was just one one thing I I just wanted to come back on. Um, my my request was actually regarding the current capacity and the potential future capacity based on the LDP planning. So if the um, presentations are available so they cover that for the education side, then then that, that would be great um, if that could be forwarded to me later. OK, can we do that, Amy? Can we forward the slides? Uh, yes, um, I believe Charlotte has already offered to send any um, St. Athens specific slides that um, she was compiling in preparation for this evening. Um, we will obviously share those directly with Ms Barnaby um, and also the present all of the presentation slides from this evening will be available to all members after the meeting. Thank you very much. Uh, if I could chair just say that if there are any queries that arise out of this from town and community councils I work with town and community councils across the Vale please do get in contact with me I'm happy to go through this on an individual community council basis and go through the details of the section 106 agreements and contributions so please let me know. Lovely thank you very much Charlotte thank you Lisa, Charlotte, Matthew and Victoria for your input tonight. So moving on, Amy, do we have um, Christian Hatfield? Has he joined us this evening? I, I have spoken to Christian Chair. He sends his sincere apologies. He's having real technical issues this evening. So unfortunately, he's not going to be able to join us. Um, but he will provide us with a written update, which I can share with members. Um, and that will include his contact details if any members wish to raise their questions directly. Um, but he, I have spoken to him on the telephone and he really does send his sincere apologies. Um, he's tried everything this evening, but he's unable to connect. Lovely. Thank you very much for that, Amy. Um, moving on to agenda item seven. Have we got Mr Tom Bowring to present this? Are you there, Tom? I am. Good evening, Chair. Um, good to see you. And I'm joined this evening by my colleague, Helen Moses. Um, with your permission, we'll share some slides initially to walk you through the item. And I think um, Town Councillor Mike Cuddy is on the line as well. Um, and he may wish to come in at um, towards the end to talk about the PSB role, if that's OK. Yep, lovely. Thank Great. you. Bear with me just a moment. Can I just double check that these are appearing on your screen, Chair? I can see them, yes, thank you. Excellent, good start to the evening. Um, <laughs> OK, so this is um, a reference from the Council's Cabinet to your committee this evening um, regarding the climate change emergency declaration um, that was made back at full council of the Bergen Morgan Council in July 2019. Just to um, give an overview of what that declaration involved, it was um, a declaration to reduce the council's carbon emissions to net zero before 2030. It included making representations to both Welsh and UK governments um, to provide us with the necessary powers, resources and technical support to local authorities such as ourselves to help us to meet that 2030 target, to continue to work with partners across the region, and I'll come on to that in a moment, um, and to work with all local stakeholders to develop a strategy in line with the target of net zero emissions by 2030, and exploring ways to maximise the local benefit of those actions across a range of, of different areas such as employment, health, agriculture, transport and the economy. Um, and since 2019 and the declaration being made, 
a significant amount of work has, has continued. Um, this is outlined in the plan which is out for consultation currently and um, which is appended to your agenda this evening. Um, and some of the highlights of that are in February of this year, the Public Services Board, the board that brings together all public service organisations in the Vedic Lamont agreed a climate emergency charter so we've all signed up to a series of commitments as organizations to tackle the climate emergency and most recently for this council in March we launched consultation on what we're calling project zero um, and project zero is basically our response to that climate emergency and what it does is contain 18 individual challenges and outlines the proposed steps that we need to take to meet those challenges. It also highlights the work that's already underway across the council because there's a significant amount of work that has been underway for many years um, in this agenda and it looks at bringing together the various different strands within one set of governance. So the idea of this um, this piece of work under Project Zero is that we integrate all of this work so that in effect the um, actions that we take are greater than the sum of their individual parts. Um, the draft challenge plan, which as I say is out to consultation currently, has those 18 commitments set out within these three individual arenas. Um, the first being demonstrating strong leadership, the recognition that as a local authority we need to lead by example. Um, the second arena is around fulfilling our responsibility to current and future generations and this chair is um, areas where the local authority can help shape the activities of others through the kind of policies and services um, and where we also have a significant influence on the actions of, of others. And the, the final um, arena is around making a difference now. So that's looking at how the council currently operates as an organisation, as an employer, how we use our buildings and how we act as a landowner and um, a landlord in order to, to drive a difference. So if I may, I'm going to hand over to my colleague Helen, who's going to walk us through just some highlights of those 18 challenges. So I'm just going to sort of take you through those 18 challenges, which, as Tom says, they provide the framework for um, the uh, Project Zero work and the draft challenge plan. They've been developed based on engagement we've done with staff and externally before Christmas and have involved really all colleagues across the council to bring this together. Um, in terms of um, the actual detail within the plan, next to each of these 18 challenges, there will, are also a number of proposed activities which we're consulting on as well to sort of yeah. provide that framework of where we are and what we think we need to do in the future. So as Tom says, we've arranged these under sort of three headings. In the first heading of demonstrating strong leadership, we have four challenges that we've identified. The first one really is about better engagement with the community, listening to their priorities for tackling climate change and supporting them so they can make a difference, so we can shape, sort of have a collective ambition for this work. And this very much came through as a, a strong theme in some of the earlier engagement work that we've done. Also, we've um, sort of been picking up on the issue around making sure that we've got clear and consistent messages about the work that we're doing and also showcasing a bit more about some of the work that we do and the successes that we do achieve. And we found this again through some of the internal external engagement that people weren't necessarily aware of some of the changes that were being made within the organisation and the differences we'd already um, started to make. We've also identified the need to uh, develop more our evidence base and our insights so we can understand more fully where to make those changes and where they will have that bigger impact and actually that wider cost of different activities. So not just the financial cost, but also think about the environmental cost to help us sort of determine what activities we need to take forward. <laughs> and then the fourth one under this section is about embracing the role of community leaders and thinking about how we can influence and enable others um, to bring about these changes and whether that's with our partners, the community or the business sector. And again, linked back very much um, to the uh, declaration that was made in 2019. One of the next slide, please, Tom. Okay. So in terms of the challenges we've identified under this section, which as Tom indicated, were the areas where we feel that through the work that we do, we can particularly have an influence over the activities of others. Um, so we've identified um, very much the need to be working with our partners in terms of reducing the risk of flooding, how we manage our coastline, and also taking a much more responsible approach to, to water use and again how we work with the community on this um, area of work. 
Um, work is being taken forward in terms of development of a green infrastructure plan, and that's involving a range of services across the council. And that picks up on the importance of green space, thinking about drainage and travel routes. And also you'll be aware of a lot of the tree planting that's being taken forward at the moment and builds on very much that activity and pulls that together. And through some of the other discussion we've had already on the engagement, people have raised issues around the importance of allotments and, and community gardens and the benefits of those as well. Um, there's also work being taken forward on the development and economic growth strategy, recognising the need for us to balance the green recovery and also economic development and how we take that forward and work with our partners as well. And then um, very much around our planning policies and regeneration activities and how we support work to adapt to and mitigate the effects of climate change. And again, building on very much a lot of the good work that's already um, in place and taking that forward. So moving on to the next slide. Um, there's a few more challenges under this section. Um, so we've identified, again, the importance of reducing the amount of energy that we all use, thinking about where we source that energy from, as well as actually reducing that use again and the influence we can have, and thinking about innovation and new technology within these sectors as well. And this can link back to the um, economic growth plan as well, and thinking about jobs in different sectors as well. Um, supporting and advocating for more sustainable local food systems and thinking about the food choices that we make and the impact they can have the environment, but also linking that to less waste and less um, and fewer food miles as well. So again, that's an area of work that we feel that we can take forward and very much work with our partners on. Reducing waste. Um, so this is about how we can raise awareness and improve education about the issues around reducing waste and recycling, but also making sure that we've got the facilities in place to encourage that and make that as easy as possible. And again, building on some of the discussion earlier that we were having around access to hospitals, thinking about forms of transport and how we can maybe encourage people to think about other forms of transport, including <coughs> walking, cycling, think about public transport as well. So the work that we can do around both education and infrastructure on that side of things. The third section then that we've um, detailed some challenges are about where we make the difference. Um, and as Tom was saying, that would be on the, ne on the next slide, that would... Uh, pick up some of the issues about how we operate as an organisation. Um, so here we're thinking about our procurement and our contract management policies and how they can support our work to tackle climate change, very much reducing waste, carbon emissions, and for example, reducing single use plastics. Uh, we've been investing in our housing stock um, to make that more energy efficient as well. And similarly, we've already heard about some of the work that's happening to um, invest in school buildings and very much now around the zero carbon schools and how we can make those much more energy uh, efficient. And these are one of the areas, again, where we feel that we um, really can um, showcase much more the work that the council is doing around the um, work with our 21st century schools. And then the final challenges under this section. Um, next slide, please, Tom. Um, uh, think about our role in terms of a landowner and a landlord, about how we manage and use our land and buildings and the other assets to support work on tackling climate change. So how we can rationalise what we need, but improve the sustainability and energy efficiency of our own buildings. Um, thinking of then in terms of transport and staff travel, how we can reduce the number of car journeys um, and increase the, uh, think about the fleet as well, the council's fleet and whether there are changes that can be made to the vehicles that we, we have. And again, that would be leading by example in terms of showing what is possible. And the final challenge that we've identified is about investing in technology so we can support home working, online services, and reduce the need for travel and office space. Um, and with these last two, I think it's very much building on some of the practices that we've experienced over the last 12 months and the changes that we've experienced um, and how we can build on those. So I'm gonna hand back over to Tom now, who's gonna pick up a bit more now in terms of some of the consultation that we're undertaking as part of this work. That's great. Thank you, Helen. Um, I, I just wanted, um, Chair and Committee, to highlight um, the consultation activities that uh, are underway to accompany this plan. Um, obviously, it's a significant piece of strategic work for the organisation. And as such, the consultation is running from the 24th of March until the 12th of May. Um, because of the, the times that we're, um, we're living in, we are relying largely on more digital means than we would ordinarily, um, but we've got a, a series of different um, ways of in consulting and engaging on this plan. So we've got an online survey running, um, which is available on the, the Council's website. And we've also um, provided information about the consultation to a range of partners, and that includes town and community councils, as well as some local interest groups, um, 
to promote the um, the consultation and, and encourage people to take part in the survey. We've also been um, working really hard to share that consultation information with as, as wide a group of people as we can do through our, our networks and contacts. Um, you may have seen um, the social media campaign, which is um, associated with Project Zero. Um, we've been running a series of Twitter polls, for example, over the last 10 days or so, um, and they've been really interesting in understanding how um, individual um, personal behaviours may um, influence um, and how we take our plan forward. Um, we've also got the first of four online discussion groups happening tomorrow evening. Um, details are on the website and I'll, um, I'll also put a link in the chat for this meeting um, so that all colleagues have got access to all of the consultation information. Um, and we're, we're looking at um, having a discussion with, with interested parties to help shape our plan um, against each of the four themes. We've also been doing um, some work to link in with our youth services and Helen um, also had a conversation with colleagues from the Vale 50 Plus Strategy Forum this week. Um, we've had some brilliant um, input already from schools and we're going to be writing out in the next couple of days to all of the schools across the Vale, asking them to share information and examples because they um, are brilliant ambassadors for this work, but also asking how they can to link in with us. Um, we've also been doing a bit of a tour of duty in terms of um, scrutiny committees and um, and obviously we're here this evening to, to share information about Project Zero and to, to ask for any views. We're also going to the voluntary sector joint liaison committee later on this week. Um, there's a Public Services Board Climate Change and Asset Management Group, and um, they're predominantly looking at how they drive forward, obviously, the charter that the PSB have developed. But I know at our recent PSB meeting, um, Councillor Cuddy raised the, um, the issue of how do we make sure that there's a, a strong connection between town and community councils and the PSB. And we discussed that potentially the work around Project Zero and climate change may be a good option, an opportunity for us to take that work forward. So with your permission, Chair, I, I just wondered whether Councillor Cuddy may like to, um, to make some representations at this point. Yes, certainly. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. we can. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm, if, if you'll permit me, uh, Chairman, Chairperson, rather, uh, I'll just broaden it a little because I, I, um, I, th I did issue a paper on the P on PSB uh, membership architecture a couple of meetings ago. I think I don't know if you remember it, but um, I think it's useful in this context. And Tom's already sort of, uh, you know, sort of uh, narrowed narrowed down the agenda which uh, town and community councils might uh, be interested in. Um, the Public Service Board uh, minutes and agendas are uh, readily available for those who are interested. As you know, I'm, I'm the representative. It's quite a difficult job. There are 26, I think, uh, town and community councils in the Vale. Difficult to represent all of them in, <coughs> at that meeting. Um, but um, I'll, there were two other I items on the agenda, the last Public Service Board, at which the uh, Climate Change Charter emergency was uh, was uh, was uh, released. Um, one was uh, a meeting, a, a prospective meeting with the minister uh, by all the uh, chairs and uh, of the public service board throughout Wales. The other was that we had a special item on the agenda to discuss only uh, town and community councils and our future relationships with the PSB. I've been sitting there for a, a while, I wasn't there at the beginning, but um, it's uh, it's been an interesting uh, uh, sort of um, view on how people learn to cooperate. And I think that's the, uh, the main lesson. Um, the meeting with the minister is because uh, the uh, cycle of uh, the main purpose of the Public Service Board, which is uh, the well local wellbeing plan, is supposed to come to an end at the end of the sort of the, uh, a parliament session and uh, that the uh, the meeting which I think has been held but I, I haven't seen uh, any minutes from it yet was to uh, review how this uh, very expensive uh, sort of uh, vehicle very complex in its architecture and in and in time and resources of the the major public bodies which have to attend them uh, besides of course the problem of those who are invited and the way in which they, without 
the big budgets can join in. So that, that's the problem. Uh, and I think there was, uh, from the discussion at the, uh, the PSV and reflecting on broader discussions within the uh, local government fraternity and the Welsh government, I think there was a, uh, a probably a consensus that um, the activity in future, the wellbeing plans, have got to be more focused and narrowed down a little. Uh, there was concern that the PSBs themselves uh, didn't have the resources, uh, and that was essentially two things. One's the money to do things. The other was the time of the uh, chief officers, who by and large attend these things, um, meeting multiple groups of PSBs. Those two things are, are, are things which will be changed, I think. There was a, a concern that the PSB has not properly joined the uh, regional uh, the regional uh, partnership board, which deals with all the health issues in an area. And uh, Mark Wilson's already sort of raised that issue, uh, the need for a more a coordinated approach. And uh, I think lastly, um, there was, uh, I think, the uh, an agreement in the plus side that uh, the main um, sort of uh, output uh, besides the actual uh, the work which has been done, I, I would ask, wonder if any of you know the your local objectives by heart. If not, uh, uh, that was uh, another criticism that, uh, of course, the uh, the well-being plan, the local well-being plan, was not really well known to the community, nor uh, indeed to many town and community councils, except those with uh, sort of a duty to uh, write reports in relation to the well the well-being legislation. Uh, the pluses take away were that um, uh, that the, the working together, as already said, the uh, the expertise which is potentially available to, to do things properly, and the the um, the lack of uh, well, the fact that uh, there will be a lack of duplication where the uh, organisations presence together with the uh, public uh, the public the regional partnership boards, if they all work together in, in terms of these plans. The uh, the other item on the agenda was the Town and Community Councils. Uh, Helen and Tom both gave uh, an explanation of the legislation, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Uh, and I um, sort of uh, reintroduced the fact that, um, you know, uh, there wasn't really a decent, well-developed connection as yet. Uh, and that the, uh, the end of the, and since the end of the cycle, um, and the beginning of a new one was uh, a great time to start uh, sort of embedding the sector within the work of the PSPs. That would mean them sort of uh, really participating in the local assessments which take place before the uh, plans are made and, and uh, developing the objectives, which, as I said, were uh, hoped to be fewer probably more broad based with the ability to run projects out of them. And you already, uh, Helen or Tom already mentioned that there is a sort of subgroup developing in relation to uh, uh, the environmental aspects uh, and I think the asset uh, transfer aspects of uh, the work in the area. Uh, so that leads right down to, um, you know, uh, what Helen and, and Tom have said, that the, um, I mean, and I think one thing they didn't mention, I think in the in and it's in the uh, the detail in the the paper, uh, your your papers, is the evidence they they put on the back of this and the seriousness of the issue. Uh, Project Zero is is a meaningful thing. Um, it's been overshadowed necessarily by COVID, but nevertheless, anyone who speaks in relation to it, uh, it, it makes makes the point that you know the house is presently burning and. Uh, it's easy enough to talk and push it into future, but really, um, this is the time to. It has to be started now. Ten years' time, it'll be too late to um, to keep to uh, two two degrees, and that's the essence of it all. I don't think that that was uh, properly uh, sort of developed, perhaps. So uh, the opportunity is here for uh, town and community councils to perhaps get a focus. Uh, I was hoping that Tom or Helen would be suggesting that uh, we will have a general meeting of the Town and Community Councils to discuss both um, representation to and with uh, and, and co cooperation with the Public Service Board going into the future 
and ask for ideas, which and I, I know lots of uh, town and community councils are actually doing many of these things already. Uh, uh, certainly with, in relation to green infrastructure, probably blue infrastructure and, and, and other issues like and, and, and probably active travel I issues. Uh, a lot of doing them separately and they're accessing uh, government grants separately. Um, there are already people will know, may know that there is a requirement on all uh, community town councils to do a biodiversity report annually. Uh, and there are uh, and besides an annual report anyway, the new legislation, and uh, the, uh, they already can access grants from uh, the green growth funds and things related to, uh, and the Vale is doing that anyway with uh, in relation to all planting trees and other packages. Uh, there is a, the opportunity, I think, well, one, you can carry on separately and uh, you get good ideas and perhaps link into the uh, objectives as they develop in the next next cycle, but more particularly, I think um, the opportunity is to try and demonstrate that, that, that working together, the uh, the whole can be greater than the sum of the parts. And uh, I hope um, Helen and Tom will be uh, are organising, and and I as well will be organising the opportunity to for the town and community council to get together to discuss both both the relationship with the uh, with the PSB generally, and there's been some comment that why can't why can't other town why can't all town and community councils join in? And that would be fairly difficult, I think, at the meetings. That is, uh, and the uh, where the focus of activity should be, and uh, Project Zero is a very good one to, to start with. Thanks. Sorry, that's a bit long, and the meeting's a bit long, <laughs> anyway. But uh, I felt it was worth saying. Thanks. Thank you very much, Councillor Cuddy. Um, Tom, are you happy to take questions at this stage? Absolutely, and and if I may, just um, just to, to conclude in terms of the the sort of timeline, so colleagues are aware. Um, Following the, the closure of the consultation process that we're currently underway and will conclude in May, we'll then be taking this back um, through the political cycle here within the Verigli Morgan. Cabinet is um, going to be happening on the 5th of July to consider the final plan and then full council on the 26th of July. Um, and as Mike was saying, this really is, I think, a, a very good practical example of where we can work collectively together. So, yes. Absolutely delighted to take any questions the colleagues have. Thank you. Um, Councillor Barnaby, you have a question to ask? Oh, yes, thank you very much. Thank you again for the presentations. Um, I'm fully on board with uh, the Z Project Zero on climate, um, and I certainly will be uh, promoting the survey on our local website. Um, I just think, though, the key the, the key uh, item that we really need to address is good planning. Um, uh, but sorry to come back to the same subject as I had earlier, but uh, we've got 1,250 houses planned in the St. Athen area, all on the back of potential jobs at the Enterprise Zone at St. Athen. These jobs are not coming yet, but the houses are. This means all these people are going to be commuting to the wider area, which is not going to be very green. We haven't got any good infrastructure for them to travel. No rail, no prop, good rail link, uh, particularly apart from Bridge End. And uh, the bus services are pretty poor. I know more people may mean that you have better buses, but um, that maybe is in the future. Um, the other thing which I have I have brought up before is um, I, I'm just wondering on the on the subject of solar panels. Um, there's a nice big school being planned in Barry. Uh, is solar panels actually on that school? You know, is that the progress now with the Vale that any new uh, council buildings would have solar panels on them? Thank you. Thank you. To, um, Councillor Barnaby and, and thank you for promoting the, the consultation that's um, that's very much appreciated and I've um, 
I've just put a link into the chat, which will take you to the consultation information with all the details of both the Project Zero plan, but also the various aspects that we've um, got underway. And you'll see within the draft plan, um, the planning is a good example here of, of where absolutely we have um, to take um, decisions and actions within the context of Project Zero, and it's about balancing lots of different competing agendas, um, and they're exactly the ones that you've you've just outlined. Um, there are commitments within the draft plan around improving active travel um, arrangements. We know that that is something that Helen was talking about earlier, that um, we reflect on our experiences of the last um, 12 months or so, and how we can support people um, going forward. In terms of um, solar panels, um, Mike um, raised earlier the importance of the evidence base and the understanding of the data that is underlying Project Zero. Um, within the plan, there's an appendix there which details the current arrangements that the Council has in place. Um, and certainly in terms of photo photovoltaics, where they are installed within council buildings and, and the main council offices have a variety of different renewable um, energy sources in, in use um, across them. And absolutely, um, we heard from colleagues at 21st century schools earlier um, where there's a commitment around um, zero carbon or um, very much reduced carbon in terms of our new builds. But there is also a commitment um, and work is underway to improve the energy efficiency of, of older legacy buildings as well. And to um, expand on the use of, of renewable technologies. So um, absolutely, it's a, 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 an interesting and, and varied picture. Thank you, Tom. Um, I don't see any other hands up. Are there any other questions for Tom or Helen? No, I can't see anything in the chat. Yes, Councillor Ian Perry, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, OK, can you see me? Uh, we can hear you. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> there's a, oh, here I can. Um, yeah, there's always this sort of ongoing thing about um, the zero carbon in use buildings. Yeah, we want to have these great, fantastic brand new buildings, but it's always new buildings and the emphasis has to change from new buildings onto the existing buildings because we're, we're talking in perhaps a millennia to, to recoup the energy that's going into these new buildings that you want to build. And um, there's the pray people who from Cowbridge. Well, the Vale wants to demolish a perfectly sound building, a building that no new building will be more than sustainable than because of this idea that you build new sustainable buildings. You do not build new sustainable buildings. You preserve what you've already got. And that is the fundamentals of sustainable building. Thank you, Councillor Perry. Um, I, I, within the plan, you'll you'll see a, um, a recognition, I hope, of of absolutely the understanding that um, this is not all about um, brand new development. That um, there are commitments, for example, within the council's housing stock um, to explore ways of making those homes um, even more energy efficient um, after a series of workers. Ah, oh, there you are. Um, it's good to see you. Um, so absolutely, um, looking at how um, retrofit can be be used within that context um, to improve the energy efficiency of, of those homes. So it, it, it is a um, it's a good example, I, I think, of where new building is happening. That there is a commitment that it's as close to or, or um, net zero as possible, and actually then a, a recognition that where we um, have existing buildings, that we do what we can to um, then try and make them as energy efficient as they they can be so it this is not going to be something that is just knock down everything and start again absolutely that term um, that clearly wouldn't be a sensible or sustainable thing to do thank you tom thank you councillor perry um no other questions um so if we finished with this agenda item, we move on to the last agenda item, agenda item eight. Thank you, um, and is it you, Tom, for presentation? Sadly, sadly, you've got Karen this evening. Oh, right. this one, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, Karen. That's OK, that's fine. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I can. Hope everybody that's, else can. That's lovely. Thanks very much. 
Well, basically, one of the reasons we brought this report tonight is so that we can provide an update for you in relation to the Local Government and Elections Wales Act. Now, no doubt your proper officers within your, well, your clerks within your community councils and town councils will have already either briefed you or provided you with an update. Um, we shared this update with them um, back at the end of January when the Act re received royal assent on the 20th of January. So um, we, we shared our action plan, which actually provides the detail of all the provisions within the Act. Um, which relate to the Vale of the Morgan Council and also the relevant parts of the Act which relate to town and community councils. And within the action plan that's attached to the report, you will see highlighted in there the matters in bold that we referred to um, as the items really are specific to town and community councils. But for the Vale and town and community councils, there are very similar actions as well. And I'll come on to those as we go through the report. Um, the 1.4, paragraph 1.4 in the report talks about the um, culmination of several years of, of, of consultation and obviously um, it was actually received royal assent in January and the Act covers um, quite substantial, um, you know, significant topics. I mean, it, it um, the first um, section refers to the reforming of electoral arrangements in within local government, extending the vote franchise to 16 and 17 year olds. Um, it introduces a general power of competence, um, the reforming of public participation in local government, reforms around the democratic governance and leadership, collaborative working, which we've been talking about earlier, you know, in, in, in the other aspects that we've dealt with tonight, other topics, um, reform of the performance and governance regime, you know, um, and then the report then refers to the key issues for consideration that um, both the Vale and Town and Community Councils will need to consider. Um, I won't go into detail in relation to the totality of the action plan, but um, I would like to point out um, the specifics really in relation to Town and Community Councils, if, if, if that's what you'd like me to do, um, which we did highlight in bold, which we hoped would um, assist you. Um, we will share with you, if you wish, you know, future meetings of progress. We have an, um, a working group within the Vale of senior officers who regularly w uh, discuss progress and where we're going on with this action plan and obviously the timescales because the one significant part of this um, act relates to the timescales and the different times that things are being brought in. There's, you know, there's some were brought in a couple of days after royal assent. Some provisions were brought in in April. Some provisions as the first of May, and then so and so on throughout the year, and then up to May 2022. So what we've done with the action plan attached to the report is we've identified the um, provisions within the act, the actions as we we see it as a council that need to be addressed, who the responsible officer is. Um, the progress update, and that's an ongoing progress. So, you know, so these columns will have already been updated recently, and I've actually got a meeting tomorrow again to go through the progress and where we're up to date, because all departments are working on these various aspects. Then it talks about when the Act is coming into force and what the provisions are, because we're still awaiting for some guidance, um, you know, from Welsh Government on some aspects. And then we, I've, we've actually put the time scales in for you to have an idea of when things are coming uh, to fruition. Um, I'll, I'll scroll down on my screen, and I haven't got it on your screen, but it's within your action plan. So if you look at um, the sections in particular that relate to you and matters for town and community councils, really, it's about the fact that we have said in our action plan that we'll raise awareness of the Act. No doubt, as I said, your proper officers will have brought a lot to your attention. But we have shared our action plan with your clerks. Um, Debbie Marles, who's the re been the responsible officer for bringing this together, um, she will also be arranging clerks meetings. I think um, a couple of meetings ago you were informed that we have regular meetings with your clerks. We invite clerks to come to meetings to discuss, share good practice and to have a meeting with the monitoring officer. 
And the next one for us now, you know, because of COVID, obviously things have um, taken um, a different fo a focus because of COVID. But we've now come back online and the first meeting back will be the 19th of May. And um, we will be sharing, you know, um, our, our progress in relation to the action plan. If they want any advice and guidance, you know, we'll discuss that with your clerks as well. I know, um, if not all of you, the majority of you are, um, affiliated to One Voice Wales, and we would always say, as you pay subscription to those, it's it's essential that you seek guidance and support from them. But obviously, within the Vale, we're also happy to support and assist you, you know, where we can. Um, so that's one of the reasons, again, why we've bringing this together. So if you've got any um, thoughts or anything you want to share, then obviously we can discuss tonight or even, you know, at other opportunities. Um, the specific actions I would probably like to um, address tonight are in relation to sections 47 and 52 of the um, Act, which are within the um, action plan. And it really talks about the making and publishing arrangements in relation to remote meetings and hybrid meetings. Again, I don't know how far down the line your um, proper officer has briefed you or your chairman and you've discussed it at committee, but there are requirements within the legislation for significant changes for you as a community council to now consider. And you're, you've obviously been dealing with um, virtual meetings, so you've, you've gone some way to um, align yourself with this legislation. But from the 1st of May, you know, the provisions have to be there that um, you must make and publish your arrangements for the purpose of ensuring that local authority meetings are able to be held by means of any equipment or other facility which enables persons who are not in the same place to attend the meetings, which includes the public. Um, Schedule 4 of the Local uh, Government and Elections Wills Act refers again to specifics in relation to sections 47 and 49 and the fact that um, it refers to the electronic servicing of summonses on members to attend local authority meetings. It's specific now for you as a community council for notices of community council meetings to provide at least three clear days before a meeting of a committee or a subcommittee of a community council, the notice of the meeting, which is, must be published electronically. Now, You've all probably been doing that anyway, but it's now a requirement as from the 1st of May. Um, other aspects, which is another significant aspect, which is a significant one for the Vale of Glamorgan as well, is that from the 1st of May, we also have to have decision notices um, published as soon as practicably possible after your meeting. And in any event before the end of seven working days, now, Again, they all must be published electronically and must include the names of the members who attended, the apologies for absence, any declarations of interest that were declared and any decisions taken at the meeting, including the outcomes of any votes. So, again, those are significant aspects that your clerk will no doubt be aware of, but you have to comply with, those le with our legislation from um, the 1st of May. There are other aspects within the action plan which um, don't come into um, the provisions don't apply until the, till May next year. But again, your um, clerk will probably be working with you on the aspects now in preparation for next year. So having a, a timetable like this has been um, really useful for us within the council because it clearly de defines the provisions. You can tick the boxes as to the things you've done. And for example, one of the actions I'll be progressing on this list is the fact that we'd have brought this report to you, you know, raising awareness again um, about the detail of the act and the significant legislation that it, you know it, it has presented to us. Um, as I said, I've spoken to One Voice Wales recently and to Paul Egan, who um, has advised me that again they're there to advise and support you as community councils and to really you know really utilize them in, in um, sharing a good practice really because it's all about you know how we do things which is a good idea to share and pick up each other's brains really on what to do going forward 
Um, and we will continue to do that within the veil as best as we can and in line with the charter provisions you know that we've said we'll bring you regular updates and um, if we can help in any way obviously we will um, but it's just to raise this awareness again for you really of what we've been doing within the veil and the requirements of the legislation for yourselves lovely Thank you, Karen, for, for that report. A, a lot of changes are happening and um, quite a bit of work for clerks and community councils. Have I got any questions on that for Karen, please? Councillor Cuddy. Yeah, it's not, it's not uh, a question. It's, uh, I didn't see you emphasising, or I don't know if you put it in, uh, the, uh, the, the requirement for a clerk to be qualified in order to... Uh, exercise uh, general competence, the power of general competence. Yeah, it's... it's that's it's, been an it's issue that's exercised a lot of councils, actually, you know, small councils about, about that issue. I, I know it's not for a year, perhaps, but it's, it is one of the big issues talked about in One Voice Wales and the, and the need for... You, you mentioned the training strategy each council has, but uh, I don't think you bring that point out. No, it's 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 within there. I mean, there are a, a number of elements within that action, you know, within the action plan and within the bill. Um, I haven't gone into detail of every specific one, but you 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 know you raise good points. Um, but yes, um, it, it is there and it is a requirement. And um, going forward, these are the aspects that when we're discussing with clerks as well on the nineteenth of May, they, they'll want to raise and have the sh that, those, that sharing of good practice between each other and those opportunities you know, going forward to make sure those requirements are met. Lovely, thank you. Um, thank you, Karen. Um, I don't see any other questions. Any other questions from anybody? If not, um, can I just thank everybody for all the presentations tonight and for everybody's attendance here? Um, I, Mike, Councillor Cuddy, is that a historic hand or did you want to come back in? OK, thank you. Um, and can I remind everybody um, that all town and community council reps that if you want a request for consideration, forms are available via democratic services should you wish to raise a matter for the committee to consider. And Amy, can I just ask you for the date of the next meeting, please? Yes, Chairman, I believe it's the 5th of July, but only one second. Um, yes, it's the 5th of July. 5th of July. Thank you very much. I think we've covered a lot of important topics here tonight and a lot of food for thought. So I look forward to hearing from everybody then on the, on the 5th of July and thank you for your attendance. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Chair. Good night. Thank you. Good Thank night. you, Chair. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night, Chair. Good night, Chair. Good night. <laughs> Good night.